My name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guests, David Gus and Alison Drasner, both of whom are associated with the Somerville Museum and the current exhibition entitled Penny Chronicles and the Stories They Tell, a fascinating and extensive display celebrating the history of Somerville. David is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Anthropology at Tufts University, and he was also the curator of the exhibition. Allison serves as the assistant director of the museum. During the program, we're finding out why and how the exhibition came about. We'll go on a behind the scenes tour and in the process come to better understand and appreciate the history of Somerville through both the medium of postcards together with many other interesting artifacts and supporting materials. Let's start by meeting our guest and then finding out all about Somerville Museum and the current exhibition Penny Chronicles and the Stories They Tell. Welcome, so delighted you're both able to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us, yeah, this is great. As I mentioned to you earlier, I had the good fortune last week to visit the museum, tour the exhibition, had a fabulous time, learned a lot, eager to hear more and have you inform viewers. Before we jump right to that, Allison, would you please start by just sharing a little bit about your role at the museum and what the Somerville Museum has to offer, please. Sure, so I am the assistant director of the museum and I've been with the museum about four, four and a half years. Um, we work a lot on day-to-day -day operations, programming, exhibitions, you name it. Um, so I'll give you a little background on the museum, just very brief um, for viewers may or may not know about the Somerville Museum. Um, the Somerville Museum has served our community uh, culture, as a cultural institution for over 100 years, and the historical collection began in 1897, and the museum building that you're seeing now was constructed in the 1920s to house the collection. We're located in the heart of uh, the city at the intersection of Central Street and Westwood Road, and as the only membership supported nonprofit, mostly volunteer run community based cultural institution of its kind in Somerville, members and volunteers are always welcome. And so while we visual, we specialize in the visual arts, including many exhibitions with both historical and local significance, the museum also offers music and lecture series, as well as many other cultural programs. So our current exhibition, as you mentioned, uh, Penny Chronicles and the Stories They Tell, opens last week and explores Somerville's history through the medium of the vintage postcard, which we're all very excited about. And one other thing I'll note is that we're currently in the midst of a major renovation to make the museum ADA compliant. And that includes the addition of an elevator, new ADA gender neutral bathrooms, and other upgrades. So this project is a $2.25 million project. And to date, we've raised 1.95 million. Uh, so we're, we're getting very close and to help fundraise for this renovation. We've launched our Access for All and More campaign. And we welcome everyone to join us in creating the space that will tell our stories for the next 100 years. And by easily you know, donating to the campaign, you can go right to our website at www.summervillemuseum.org. I'm also very impressed with how the museum reaches out and involves the community to a larger extent, whether it's as guest curators or the collaboration you seem to have with the Somerville schools as well. Yeah, no, that's been uh, something that we've worked on quite a bit and it's uh, unique for a town our size to have such a museum. I noticed that you uh, featured Brattleboro a couple of weeks ago in one of your programs. And, and there's a, an interesting parallel in terms of the types of things we've been doing in a small institution with no help really from the city in terms of uh, budget. Uh, it's completely volunteer driven and by donations. And as Allison mentioned, this campaign really uh, shows the incredible support that we do have in the city. David, would you continue by just sharing a little bit about your background and then how you developed an interest in your role as the curator of this exhibition? 
Sure. I, uh, as you mentioned, I'm an anthropologist. I've worked in uh, many parts of Latin America. I lived in the Amazon for many years and did what we think of as traditional anthropology. Um, I sometimes joke that having a degree in anthropology is having a license to collect. And indeed, I'm a, I am a collector. Um, and my first collection was postcards. I started collecting postcards in uh, 1972. Uh, 71, which is 50 years ago. Uh, I don't think of this as a commemorative exhibit, but it's kind of the jubilee of David Gus's collection. Um, and nevertheless, it was uh, a collection that I began while I was backpacking uh, from Los Angeles to Santiago, Chile, uh, why, uh, to see the revolution that Allende was bringing about in South America at the time. And with very little room to add anything to my backpack, I started collecting postcards. And postcards are sort of a poor man's art form. And they certainly, in terms of their history, are extraordinary uh, as the sort of the opening sort of fusillade in what we might call visual culture. And the visual culture we know today was really uh, introduced by the postcard, something that's uh, you know, making a, a big claim for a small picture but nobody else in terms of newspapers or magazines was publishing colored four point lithograph uh, images of this sort at the time that the first postcards were produced, which although earlier in Germany and the United States are sort of introduced to the, uh, the public during the Grand Columbian exhibition in 1893 in Chicago. Um, and from that, I built a collection that got to be rather large um, and, uh, uh, part of that collection is about Somerville, which is a city I've lived in for many years. And um, it became uh, clear that it would be good for the museum, good for me as a collector to do this show about the history of Somerville, because it really connected all the different interests that the museum has in culture, in art, in history, uh, and the participation of the community. And then from the beginning, how did you go about envisioning the exhibition. There are a number of collaborators I know involved and just gathering the range of items for the exhibition. Well, I've done other exhibitions and I should say as an anthropologist, I really did, uh, my focus was the anthropology of art. And um, so I looked at art from many different uh, perspectives. And one was thinking about art and institutions and cultural institutions uh, and the way that they intersect with all points of our life. And that's how I got involved with the Somerville Museum. So in 2001, I discovered a set of photographs at a flea market, which were pictures of movie theaters that a salesman, a candy salesman, no doubt, who was selling to uh, the, the counters at, at uh, movie theaters. These were pictures of Somerville movie theaters that had existed, which I had no idea that they were ever there. And um, there were 14 in all, 14 movie theaters. <laughs> And with those pictures, I went to the Somerville Museum. I had never been there before. Evelyn Battinelli, who is the executive director, was there. And when I showed her the pictures, she in her typical form said, oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, that's the old Broadway theater. Oh yeah, that's the Teal Square. And it really opened this window uh, in terms of that world. And from those initial pictures, and this is talking about 2001, 2002, I launched a, a large exhibit at the museum. It was installed for a year with an enormous amount of outreach that included bringing the uh, famous actress, uh, Frances D, the star of I Walk With a Zombie, which we showed uh, to Somerville. And um, people still talk about that exhibit. It's available much online in uh, www.losttheaters.org. Um, but that is what brought me to the museum. I eventually became a trustee at the museum and have really worked there for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, again, as a volunteer, like everybody else. Wonderful, wonderful. And then when you had this vision for Penny Chronicles, what was the process like collecting the materials? And would you speak also to the other collaborators yeah. uh, that are involved? Well, it, it's interesting. And, you know, then uh, also the fact of COVID played a part. I mean, it seems like COVID played a part in all of our lives in, in, in important ways. The exhibit was going to be opened in May uh, 2020. Uh, and actually, two months earlier, I had uh, COVID and uh, it was it was rough going, but it was clear that 
this show was not going to uh, open then. And uh, as a result, I had a lot more time to prepare it and a lot more time to work with people in the community. And there were a number of people who I knew from websites that they had collections. And through their postings, I made contact with people like Christy Chase and Jeff Myers and uh, um, Wayne Colella. And they all had collections of postcards about Somerville. And um, I reached out to them and formed a small group. And in the end, we were about six or seven people. And we met every couple of weeks and talked about what an exhibit would be like. And hopefully I wasn't too heavy handed in designing it and <laughs> too autocratic, but, um, but we got wonderful input and the collections of postcards that they had was, were tremendous and really allowed us to expand on what was the really wonderful collection put together by a man named Richard Peters. And so Richard Peters was a fire investigator in Somerville. He did not live in Somerville. He was an avid collector of postcards. And one of the categories he collected were postcards of Somerville, but he collected many different postcards. And there was a person and she's in the show tucked away in a way which I'll explain later named Isabel Cheney. And Isabel Cheney was really the heart of the movement to save this wonderful institution early on the, when it was a historical society before it became just the Somerville Museum. And in her later years, she had this uh, extraordinary collection of Somerville postcards. And she had dementia in her later years and people took advantage of that and her collection just disappeared, it, it evaporated. And when uh, Richard Peters retired, Evelyn Battinelli went to him and said, you've got to leave your collection of Somerville postcards here. We've lost Isabel Cheney's famous collection and we need to replace it. And he left his collection. And it is a brilliant, brilliant collection of postcards. And that was the core of our show. And that was the core of the collection of postcards. Um, again, the other people I mentioned all had collections of postcards and Somerville postcards, but it was the Peters collection that let us build on, on what we did. And it's a tremendous collection. Before we step inside and take a visual tour of as much of the exhibition that we can during our time, would you please share just briefly an overview of how you and others organized the exhibition, different themes roughly? Well, there, you know, there was a couple of aspects. There's the, there's the physical question, uh, which is um, challenging when you're talking about images that are all three and a half inches by five and a half inches. That's small. Um, and so you would get very tired if you were just looking at these smaller images all the way through the show. So I, I started off by thinking about different ways of displaying and exhibiting these postcards throughout the show so that each of the 14 or so sections is done very differently in the way that the postcard is exhibited. And that was an exciting challenge uh, and I think successful one. And we, we created an open space as you come into the gallery that you can look at as you're seeing that open space there, you can look at some of the different ways in which we were able to make the display and simply the ones that you're showing there on the left is the famous tower um, at, at Prospect Hill, uh, which is one of the most important historical sites in the city. It's where the first American flag was raised uh, and George Washington was present at that event. It was where the Citadel, which is a fortress during the revolution existed. Um, so it's a very important site. And here we took a postcard and we blew it up to uh, about seven feet high. And mm -hmm. that was quite a challenge. The big challenge was to find a postcard that could handle it, uh, that didn't dematerialize, that didn't uh, become too bespeckled. Uh, and this one, it handled it very well indeed. And many uh, other postcards we handled differently. Um, certainly we didn't have a blow up of this magnitude, but we thought that this was really important in terms of its iconicity, in terms of telling a story. So there's the story of the postcards, then they are the Penny Chronicles, and then there's the stories they tell the Penny Chronicles. Well, he, the range of stories is quite extensive from historic landmarks like we see here, 
to these very personal correspondences that you document so well. Just a quick word of the Dear Ethel feature. Uh, and, you know, thanks for pointing that out, Jay, because uh, you know, one of the things with postcards, most people look at the front of the postcard, the image, um, and I'm fascinated by the message and what it tells us about people at that time. And the Dear Ethel uh, postcards are a correspondence from one high school student in Somerville, uh, and um, her name is Jessie Phillips. And in 1905, she was corresponding with another young person in Moncton, uh, Moncton uh, New Brunswick in Canada. And um, she, Ethel, uh, not Ethel, but the woman who wrote these was also Canadian. And her father had moved from Canada to Somerville to work in the railroads. And this was a time in 1905 where there was an absolute craze going on for postcards. Everybody in the United States was collecting them. And in the year 1905, when these postcards were sent, there were 7 billion postcards mailed worldwide. There were 1 billion ma mailed in the United States. That's the ones that were mailed. You have to imagine that many people bought the cards and didn't mail them. So it could have been 14 billion. I started to realize, this is parenthetical, that a lot of the cards that I had were from 1905. I never sort of put that together, but 1905 became a period in which uh, many of these cards were sent. It also predates the moment when postcards allowed you to write on the back next to the address. Until 1907, they were called undivided backs. You could only, and you see that uh, uh, if you're looking at the image right there on the lower left, you see that there's a address and stamp on one side of the postcard, and there's a, a warning, do not write anything but the address on this side. So you have to be very creative if you were gonna send a message to work around the image and to write on the front of the postcard. So all of these Dear Ethels are written on the image part of the postcard, which makes them even more interesting. And their quality is exquisite. Um, this was the uh, the grand era, the golden era of the postcard, as we call it, 1905 to 1915. And it really kicks off with correspondences like this between friends who are postcard pals. And she was a postcard pal to Ethel. And Ethel uh, Moore, which was her name, somehow or other, she and then her family kept all of these postcards together. And at a certain point, some of them appeared on eBay. And I spotted them and I realized wow, these cards are all to the same person. And then I called the dealer and asked him, he said, yeah, I just bought this collection. And <laughs> yes, there are all these postcards from this girl in Somerville. Wow. So he sold me the whole collection. And, and that was a little treasure. You really, you know, you got a window into uh, what it meant to send postcards and be a postcard collector at that time. And to think about what was important. So many of these comments were, which are in those little clouds, uh, which transcribe what uh, she wrote, are talking about the picture on the postcard, what she could get and what she could find and what was not available and what she knew that Ethel was looking for. And, it would be great if we could get uh, Jesse's collection, but in any right. that would be fabulous. A, a really intimate discussion between two young people in 1905, and that's a lot of fun. To see. Uh, let's continue our tour and just a um, word about the monuments war section. Well, you, one realizes that looking at postcards, you're you're kind of looking at a map of your city. So every city had postcards, uh, no matter what, if it was just of a church or a school, there was something that they had of value. And the more valuable, the more iconic, the more important historically the site was, the more likely you're going to find uh, a lot of variants of those postcards. In Somerville, there's uh, two of those sites. One is, as we were talking about, Prospect Hill, and the other is the Powder House. And we have a very interesting uh, Powder House pinata. So we played a lot with these different forms. And uh, those are the two dominant images when you go to a postcard show where dealers are selling postcards and you go through the racks of all the images that they have, it's likely that you'll find quite a few of either Prospect Hill or the Powder House. And so if you look at all of these, the, the most commonly uh, sold and created postcards, 
you start to see almost like a kind of map of the city, the way that it inter intersects. The, all these different parts of the city have these uh, iconographic uh, spaces that postcards support and that when people collect and write in them uh, is replicated quite a bit. And so they became our guide in terms of the way that we were going to organize the show, but doing it in such a way that wasn't simply the image of these uh, simple cards, but telling a story uh, between how the cards uh, reflected the thing that they were showing and what the importance of that was, uh, such as in the Monuments War, where, uh, as we know, uh, there was a kind of competition going on between Southern states and Northern states after the age of reconstruction uh, and beginning in Jim Crow when monuments started to uh, proliferate throughout the South and they were met by monuments in the North at the same time. And as we know, and, and I talk about in the wall text, it was a moment in which history and memory were being challenged and rewritten. And um, that was something that was very, very clear in terms of, as we you know historically, the way that all of a sudden slavery and race fell out of the Southern version of the war and the reasons for the war. And now it was states' rights and, uh, and tradition and issues such as that. And um, that's uh, something that we wanted to talk about uh, in particular because the monument that was placed in Somerville to the uh, sailors and soldiers of the Civil War was placed there rather late in comparison to others. It was 1909. And that was exactly during this time in the Monuments War. The Monuments War is a war of memory and history. And, uh, and that's the story that we're, we're telling there, um, how that it pl played out in Somerville. Yeah, it's a nice example of what you also point out with postcards as far as from the past 100 years or so ago relating to issues today. Yes. And we definitely know that ongoing monuments war still today for sure in the news. Absolutely. And that was, uh, you know, paramount in, in our thinking as we put that show together. So you're looking at the Monuments War there, and right next to it is Parks and Recreation to the side there. I don't know if you get a fuller view. And Parks and Recreation is a story of both lost opportunities in terms of creating more open space in Summerville, which is the most densely populated city in the north, uh, Northeast and perhaps the, north, uh, the, the East Coast of the United States. And not only is it the most densely populated, but a lot of that city has been uh, stripped bare of trees and is now a hot spot uh, in the city, as we know in, in terms of the, the amount of concrete that is in the city and asphalt that's in the city. Somerville had a lot of opportunities and they lost a lot of them. Uh, developers who were often the mayors of Somerville early on just didn't want to give up the land. It was seen as a, uh, a really great opportunity for building homes, triple deckers. And, um, and that became a conflict. If it wasn't the monuments war, it was the open space war. Mm -hmm. open. Well, you know, oh, in the five minutes or so we have left, were you gonna just move ahead and maybe just a very quick comment as we go through? I know here's the back wall, yes. which is a, wonderful Som Somerville souvenir plate there. But and that souvenir plate, Jay, is like an index to the show. It's all the items that we've been talking about. And wonderful commentary by yourself setting up uh, the intention of the show underneath there. A word or two, because these items are both playful and meaningful for the exhibition. Yeah, they are, and there's, they are certainly playful, and it's a way of uh, transferring this information without becoming too didactic. So the four presidents, of course, are the four presidents who overlap the time period of the show uh, and the, uh, the golden age of the postcard, uh, starting with McKinley, who is assassinated, as we know, and right behind Jose Gregorio right here, which seems like a dome, is the building where he was assassinated. And that brings, of course, Teddy Roosevelt to be president. And Teddy Roosevelt handpicks Taft. And Taft is, you know, his, his follower. But once he becomes president, he becomes very independent. And as we know, that leads to a split Republican Party that brings the first Southern president since the Civil War, who is Woodrow Wilson. And so 
we're telling that story through images and as you say, through a, a playful form. Um, it's also a centerpiece and an altar for um, the show. And what's curious I have to say is that this figure in the middle, uh, who I know very well from working in Latin America, I don't identify in the, in the caption. And I'm surprised <laughs> no one's asked. They said, no one has said, who is this strange guy? And is it, is it a pre vice president? <laughs> um, it, anyway, he's a, he's a South American saint named Jose Gregorio uh, from Venezuela, who's a very interesting history. And he, of course, relates quite a bit to this other Latin American motif, which is the altar for the Day of the Dead um, that all these, these four presidents find themselves in. So um, it's a centerpiece for the show. And just a word about the wide shot we see here, please. Yeah. Well, you, you see, of course, the, at the very center and at the center of the world is the powder house. And that's a powder house, Pinata. Of course, this is based on the powder house that still exists in, uh, in uh, the powder house park, which is at the edge of West Somerville near Tufts University. And it's a gorgeous park in which this uh, early grist mill was built and then became a place where the colonials put all of their gunpowder. And so it became the, the powder house. And that was raided by the British in 1774 and emptied out. And many people consider that the beginning of the American Revolution, not what happened a year later. One of the problems with telling the story of Somerville's importance historically is that it wasn't Somerville when these events happened in what became Somerville. It was part of, uh, uh, Charlestown. And so um, the credit of thinking about these events in Somerville is has that problem. Um, but thinking about the center of the world and the powder house, as you see there, I started to look at other images of obelisks and other world centers. And um, so we have a whole wall devoted to them. And then on the right side are it's a, a wall devoted to streetscapes. And the last development in Somerville, which again was very controversial in terms of were we gonna uh, give this development a park or not? And the developers did not want to park because they didn't want to give up a couple of houses or whatever it would have cost them. And these are blowups of postcards of these streets, completely empty houses are some lived in and most of them waiting to be lived in. Um, there were 500 new homes that were built in the last development in Somerville. And these postcards as blown up and well printed, they all look like gorgeous lithographs. They're really quite amazing. And photog the photographer who had a sense of humor placed himself in every one of these photographs. <laughs> and um, you can, it's hard to notice, but there's always his car or a, a buggy. He seems to have, sometimes he came on a little motorcycle, but he, he always put something of himself in these photographs, which otherwise seem very sterile, although stunning. Yeah, absolutely stunning uh, photographs, but there, there are no people in them. There are the homes uh, ready to be moved into. Well, unfortunately, time has gone so, so fast. We've just really scratched the surface of all that you and others have put together. So definitely encourage people to make their way to Somerville Museum. It's going to be up and open through January uh, 2022, so plenty of time to make it over there and find out even more than um, David, you've outlined for us today. So in closing, thank you, Allison, again, for taking the time to be here. David, congratulations on the outstanding exhibition. I look forward to going back and learning more because really just scratch the surface on one visit on both the exhibition with Somerville and just the historical record of what postcards stood for back then um, opened up uh, a lot for my information that uh, I hadn't been aware of. So thank you on several different levels for the exhibition. Well, thanks for having us. I also want to thank those of you watching for joining and hope you'll be able to tune in next time. <laughs>